the sanctuary or participating on Zoom or reading the recording afterwards. We are an open and affirming church. You're welcome here no matter who you are and no matter where you are on life's journey. Um, today we're pleased to welcome a guest pastor, Reverend Beth Gleason. Um, Beth is a UCC pastor, also a hospital chaplain. Delighted to have you here, Beth. So welcome. Yes. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Katie, for that lovely intro, and thank you for these gorgeous flowers. I had the chance to speak to some of your congregants, some of you. In fact, I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see you this morning. There you are. Hi, everybody. And I got I was actually interviewing you. You didn't know that, did you, Bill? I, I, I didn't know that. I, I was Oh, oh. <laughs> zing, zing. <laughs> so here's what I heard that you think about your church. You love your church because you do so much in the community and you're important. There's a tremendous amount of history in this church and people are dedicated to the fact that they're from here, from this community, you know, in the area and that this church is part of their personal history and their family's personal history. So I heard a lot of love. Touched my heart. This is a good place. And now we can negotiate my salary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got Dave laughing. Okay, I'm so sorry. Let us return to the spirit of worship by which we are gathered here today. Would you join me and Greg in the call to worship? Whether we are young or old, bent over or standing tall, or somewhere in between, God calls us. In dry deserts and beside springs of water, when we feel strong and safe, and when we feel scared or abandoned, God calls us. God calls all of us and offers to set us free from whatever keeps us bound. Let us come again in all of our church and praise to this wondrous God. Please join in him of praise as we gather at your table, number 314, in your
at a recent council meeting, we said, oh, we have these flyers that tell all about our church and encourage people to come. And all the information is incorrect or outdated. So we have new ones with great info, and we want you to take one home and love it. And also, if there's somebody that you think might be interested, this tells us a little bit about the church. And we didn't know how many to make, so it's clearly not enough, but there will be more. person in the world to get to get all the people to be able to sign up in such a methodical way too and this list is now complete so you'll be able to take a look at the list so that you can see what you'll be having too it'll still be out in the fellowship hall after church especially I want to thank each of you I look so forward to joining together with all of us in the fellowship hall again as we gather at the table of the Lord. Thank you. Are there any other announcements yet, Cheryl? I just want to remind people to sign up for um, bringing in flowers on Sunday. There's a sign up list right up there. And you can bring in uh, something for your garden, or wildflowers, or Any, anything else? Okay, so we now turn our hearts more intentionally to worship. Would you join me in the opening prayer? Oh, sacred word of life, we rejoice in your call in our lives. Open our ears to the whispering spirit that gathers us into one body, your church. Amen. 
lovely. Thank you. So this morning we're going to have a sermon from Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was a really interesting prophet. He was called at a very young age by God to be his prophet in a very tumultuous time. So I'm going to speak more about Jeremiah's character and ministry during my sermon. And I chose this sermon because this is our first time together and I want you to get to know me. And if you like this sermon or you resonate with anything that is said in scripture or during the words, then, um, then let us have our Lord lead the way to whatever occurs for this beautiful church next. So the first reading is Psalm 71, <clears throat> verses 1 through 6. And if you follow along in your pew Bible, it will be on page 654. It's as if you have a large print one, otherwise it's 503. Okay, what's the other page? 503. 503. Psalm 71, verses 1 through 6. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope, my trust. O oh Lord, from my youth upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. The second reading, our scripture this morning, is from the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah. In my Bible, it's in 854. In your Bible, does someone have a page? 656. Six. Oh, you want to do it? I can do it. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Greg. Oh, yeah, there it is in the book. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the second reading is from the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 1. Jeremiah's call and commission. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy. For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. So ends the reading. Thank you, Greg. You did that so much better. I'm going to repeat the first couple of verses of our Jeremiah passage. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Isn't that a gorgeous passage? So many people find comfort in verses 4 and 5 that I just read. But in those days, these were radical words. Words full of flame not fleecy and warm the way we first hear them or want to hear them. And to understand this, it's important to know Jeremiah's backstory. Jeremiah was the reluctant prophet. He lived in a time 
when the map of the ancient world was being redrawn. Assyria was weakening, Babylon was rising, and Egypt was eager to assert its authority. And this tiny little kingdom of Judah was caught in the center of this geographic triangle in the middle of these three great powers. Judah was threatened, and to make matters worse for the Judeans, they believed that they were truly invincible. And why was this? Because a century earlier, Jerusalem had miraculously survived destruction, and in consequence, the Judeans came to have a very dogmatic belief that the city would never fall and that King David's dynasty would last forever. So it was against this turbulent background and the stubborn refusal of Jeremiah's own people to face the tough political realities of a changing world that Jeremiah's life and ministry was shaped by. Now, Jeremiah's father was a village priest, kind of a step, well, a major step down below prophet. And his childhood was very happy. He loved the natural world and spent a lot of time in nature. Kind of sounds like us, doesn't it? And when you read his book of the Old Testament, we learn that he loved to watch the migration of birds. That's in chapter 8. He even knew the nesting habits of the partridge. That's in chapter 17. But when these prophetic visions early in his life, the natural world became something more for him. They became revelations of the mystery of God. Now into this life of happy family, birds, nature, God, Jeremiah's call by the Lord comes. From the beginning, he was the reluctant prophet. That's what we used to call him in our Old Testament, sem Old Testament seminary class. And he never ceased to talk to God about the trials of this office of being a prophet. From these passages, we glimpse the sheer burden of the task that he has to bear. It does not seem to be made of the stern stuff that prophets are supposed to be made of. He was a very sensitive youth. He was only 20 years old when he was called by God. And we know this from his readings, that he had an exceptional capacity for affection. And yet God gave him a mission, quote, to pluck up, to break down, to destroy, and to overthrow among the people he loved. This was a path of pain for Jeremiah, but he never flinched. And his prophecies over his 40 years of ministry were moving and at times shocking. He longed to leave his mission behind, but the power of God would not leave him. Here he says in chapter 20, If I say I will no longer mention him, God, there is a heart, there is in my heart, as if it were a burning fire. Indeed, Insights like these grew out of personal experiences of a life lived against the grain of society, but he was in total trust and loyalty to his creator. Now there's underlying hurt in Jeremiah's prophecies in chapter 1, which Greg just read. And it was involved in the fact that God told him to close down Judah's high places, to center the religious life of the nation on Jerusalem, out of Jerusalem, and this was a move that brought on conflict within his family as well as the Judeans. And because of this and other threatening political complications, Jeremiah was, and here's the kicker, Jeremiah was absolutely hated by his people. He was banned from the temple, and so he dictated his prophecies to his scribe and his best friend, Baruch, who took them secretly to religious leaders and to the king, which the king would promptly burn, and then the king, at one point, threw Jeremiah into a well to starve. And you don't kill prophets, because that's not a good political move, but you can certainly abandon them in a well to starve. And it was only the intervention of a brave palace servant that saved him, that 
plucked him out of the well so he could continue his prophetic ministry. Now, if all of this is beginning to sound like the remake of an Indiana Jones movie, and before I put you to sleep with even more historical facts about the crush I have on Jeremiah, I think we might want to consider the parallels for all of us right here and right now. The point of this story so far is that Jeremiah became convinced that there had to be a new beginning for his people. Jeremiah states right up front, without a doubt, that his message was a word. He says in this very sim simple way, the first sentence of chapter 1 is, the words came from God himself. When he says, quote, the word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord came to me. And it runs as a refrain throughout the book, no matter how many hardships he faced or no matter how much his message was dismissed by the people. So God shows and explains to his prophet what he's going to do and what Jeremiah must tell the people and what they do not want to hear. They will be against Jeremiah from the outset, but God will protect him. And the pattern of Jeremiah's whole life is set out in chapter 1 in this first reading because of his initial encounter and hearing of God's voice. So what can this reading about Jeremiah tell us today? I think the answer is a great deal. For we in the United Church of Christ identify ourselves as the still speaking church. And to quote the UCC website, quote, we all listen for a still speaking God. So I would ask you this morning, what matters to you in this Kingdom of America 2022? What are the sounds or voices of God that you hear in your lives? What is the sound of God's realm breaking through to each of you? Let me quote from the section on what matters to us on the UCC website. Quote, if you think God's not finished with you yet, guess what? God's not even finished with God yet. Don't you love that? God isn't finished with you, or finished with the church, or finished with our world, or even letting us know more about God's own compassion, justice, hope, and truth. If you are open, if you listen carefully, you'll discover what God is saying to this generation at this time in history. And there's more good news to be heard. Without a doubt, this understanding of God's ongoing revelation is a central aspect of the United Church of Christ faith. And while we believe that God was revealed to us in the past, we are a people who lean, lean into the future. Here's another quote from the UCC website. In the Bible, God was known through covenants with people and nations, through prophets, through conflicts and commandments, in visions and songs, and through the followers of Jesus and the church. God acted profoundly in the life and ministry, even in the death of Christ. And on Easter, God declared in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, quote, I'll never, never stop speaking. Alleluia. Throughout history, in moments of compassion, justice, and peace, in our worship, in this space, in our sacraments, our prayers, our seeking, our action, and our silence, our God continues to speak. Now that may sound sweet in this beautiful worship space, but how do we live that out in our own lives after we've had our coffee or cheese and crackers in the worship, in the fellowship hall after church? How do we speak truth to power, no matter how unpopular or how hated it might be to hear it? Like our friend and prophet Jeremiah, even when we feel that no one is listening. I have a couple of suggestions. First, and this is an easy one, 
tell stories because stories go viral. And I don't care if they're around the village of Standish and Buxton and Hollis, or if they're on the social media or on the web or any other tradition, because the oral tradition of speaking to each other and sharing our stories is still alive and well. A few Sundays ago, I'm a supply pastor for three other churches. I go all over Western and Southern Maine. I serve a church in Lowell, which is uh, on the way to Bridgeton. And a few Sundays ago, when I was up there, a member of the congregation, an older lady, told me this story that I'm going to share with you. Her son was a man important or powerful enough to get a meeting, personal one-on-one -on -one meeting with our former president. And when he told her about his meeting with, her, with him, he said the first thing he said to her was, Mom, you're not going to believe it, but there were two books on the presidential desk in the Oval Office, and they were both about Hitler. There was stunned silence between us as soon as she related this fact, and I, in turn, have passed on this story many times to my friends and relations with the hopes that this story has grown exponentially around this country. Second, if we tell stories, if we tell stories, we have to stay informed. And this stands to reason. Jeremiah's source of information was direct from God when he prophesied to his people. And while our sources may not be as compelling, it is contingent upon us as the most educated denomination in all of the Christian mainline denominations to use reliable sources of information too. In reading the New York Times online a week or so ago, after I was in Wyoming for three weeks, I was reaformed of this rate of where there's no um, where I was in Wyoming was so remote, there was no um, access to any kind of technology, which was actually a blessing. But I came, stepped at, back into the state of this country's democracy with very upsetting news, and that some of the candidates for the next presidential race had outlined their platform in very dis with very dis ideas which really disturbed me. So I say to you, stay informed. Even if you don't like what you are hearing or what you are reading, stay informed. It's critical. As the bumper sticker on my best friend's truck states, you are entitled to your own opinions, but you are not entitled to your own facts. Finally, stick close to home. Does this mean that you can't use the Hannafords down the street and you have to go into Portland to use Trader Joe's? No. Hardly. What this means is that the United Church of Christ offers multiple opportunities, I'm sure through this faith community as well as other uh, churches and faith communities in Maine, and it, it offers you as a church as well as you as individuals to become involved in remedying contemporary issues of concern. All you have to do is go to the UCC website, it's ucc.org, for example, and you'll see half a dozen ministries that you can join and participate online. There's a Justice and Peace Action Network. There's a Disabilities and Mental Health Justice Network, an Environmental Justice Ministry, a Racial Justice Ministry. It's a long list of which we can truly be proud. And finally, collect, connect, connect with your neighbors. You may be surprised at how many Jeremiah's there are in York and Oxford and Cumberland County. I was both pleased and shocked at a group of Bridgeton women standing around the town, town monument protesting, this was about a month ago or so, protesting the Supreme Court's ruling on abortion. Their sign said, honk if you support us. And I pulled over in my car to observe what was going on secretly fearful for their safety. And yet, at least every other car on that busy Main Street haunt in agreement with their points of view. 
So no matter where you fall on this side of the issue, these folks found the Jeremiah in them to stand up and speak up. And in daring to be unpopular, like Jeremiah, they too were still speaking. Am I proselytizing this morning? You betcha. Have I probably pissed somebody in these pews off? Maybe that too. But I invite the God-inspired, God-informed Jeremiah in each of you to emerge and engage your inner prophet. These times, you too have the bravery and the boldness to do so. And just like Jeremiah, your ability to still speak demands nothing less from each of us as the still speaking people. Amen. Oh, and I want to point out the sermon. I forgot in the beginning, because this is my first time here. The name of the sermon, take a look, get your bullet. We're going to go through it. All of these things mean say it, speak out in a different language. So what's deep there? Everybody knows that. French. Very good. What's Tigala? Very good. Lady in the green in the back. What's Shatsi say? No idea? Turkish. Soyla? French. No? Dita is, so is French. Soyla is um, Romania. Spuneo or Spuno? Anybody? No, it sounds Italian though, doesn't it? No, it's uh, Croatian. And Shatse Edo? Pretty good, but it's Russian actually. Yeah. And I just wanted to point out that the last five are all countries that are run by, actually last four that are run by dictators. Speak out. Amen. Would you join us now in the hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West, page 381.
email, whatever that is received so far, and especially the press. Please be continue. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Katie and I are down in the shop. We dropped off Solvay's college yesterday. So a big transition time here. Um, really happy for her. So is this her first year? First year. And your first child? Uh, no, it's our, well, we have three children, but it's our first child for college. Oh, yeah. that's very sweet. <laughs> Were there tears all around? And where is she at school? She's at Endicott College in Dublin. Oh, wonderful. Good. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, I have a couple of joys. And I took Sarah and Rich in there. Um, I took Jen to the doctor last Tuesday. And we had some hopeful information come from that. So that was a blessing. And then when we got home, I got a message that my last born son was being air flighted to a hospital with a heart attack. Oh my. But he was only in the hospital for three days. They put a stand <coughs> in his heart and he is home and doing well. Great. So. What's your son's name? Brent. Brent? Brent. Some of the people here will know him. He was here one of the one. His wife is um, a black lady and she's deaf, but she could hang on to the railing in front of her and she was here and feel the music so she could sing. Lovely. And your friend who had the positive news from the doctor, what was that person's name? Jane. That's Jane. Okay, great. Anyone else? Yes. I have a cousin who's in prison for five years. And in his last letter, we correspond with each other. He said, for the last month, he's having a difficult time. So please keep my cousin in your prayers. What is his name? I won't say that. OK. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, hi. Okay. Uh, yeah. Some of you may know that my, uh, my mother, Jan Stinson, who's been here a few times, uh, Diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, which is spread to a couple other locations in the body. So I should be starting chemotherapy in a couple weeks. Um, so I'd like to have her add to the prayer list. Um, if you're familiar with the website Caring Bridge, there is a Caring Bridge site set up. So if you search Jane Stinson, uh, you find it if you'd like to keep updated with, with uh, her progress. So send you well wishes. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Kate. Anyone else? So it's rare that I offer up joys and concerns, but this was quite a week for me. I had, um, I have several friends who are either dying or died. So I'd like to lift up Ivan, whose funeral was yesterday. Trisha, my friend who is a Buddhist nun named Kenmo, who is in the last stages of breast cancer. My friend Bill, who is in hospice. And my friend Margaret, who is at the rehab hospital in Portland with a stroke. My five precious friends. Is there anyone else? Then let's just have a moment of silent prayer where we speak to our Creator and lift up our own concerns and our joys, both for the week past and the week to come. Holy and gracious God, as we end our summer together and begin to see the trees turn rip, tiny little specks of red on the end of our leaves, we know that change is always a constant in our life. 
We thank you for the privilege of being able to worship together this morning and to share in Christian community all those people who matter to us, those people that we love. We ask for prayers of healing and comfort for Guy and Millie. Guy is facing surgery in early September and he needs our prayers of support. We thank you, Lord, for daughters that go off to college and we send Solveig to Endicott in Boston with our blessing as a faith community that she have a successful first year in school. We thank you, Lord, for the joy that can come from positive doctor visits, especially for James. And we thank you for the intervention of first responders who are there to take us to the doctors quickly, whether it's by plane or helicopter, so that things like heart attacks can be part of our past. So heal, send healing prayers and great prayers of gratitude, grateful prayers for Brent. Lord, we lift up all those who are incarcerated, but especially for beloved cousins who are in prison who are having a difficult time. We keep them in our heart today and always knowing that their struggle is real. Finally, Lord, we lift up all those who suffer from cancer. And in particular, we lift up Jan Stinson, Dave's beloved mother who has stage four cancer. And hopefully, Lord, we will remember all of us to put good wishes of health and love on her Caring Bridge page. Lord, walk before us with our week to come as we go back to school or wrap up our summer and prepare for the Labor Day weekend. In all things, Lord, we are grateful and remember that you are number one in our life. Amen. Uh, we now come to the time to think about how you can contribute to the church financially or otherwise. We're still not passing the plate, but if it's right up front, you should leave the sanctuary and place your offerings on the plate. You can also mail your donations. Um, the information is in the announcements page. It's also a web page, so however you do it, please uh, continue to support the church. And, and we do appreciate the continuing support that has been very strong through this transition period. And appreciate any other way people help, whether it's financially, with time, talent. Um, we just appreciate everything everyone does for so please think about how you can give as Katie plays the offer.
God bless you and God bless your week.